Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today's show we're going to be talking about Custer's and Art's Undermining Free Will in the Journal of Science. Okay, now Custer's, um, Rude Custer's, and Hank Art's are psychologists. They published um, a paper on July 2nd, 2010 in the Journal of Science. And it's a landmark paper, uh, as you'll see later. The title of the paper is The Unconscious Will, How the Pursuit of Goals Operate Outside of Consciousness Awareness. <coughs> Conscious awareness. So in, in other words, they're basically kind of like undermining the, um, the notion of free will very empirically. And again, Custers and Arts are psychologists from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, the journal Science, there are several peer-reviewed journals in the world that are like among the tops. And, and Science, the journal Science, it's a, a weekly science journal. It, um, it covers, whereas most or a lot of science journals cover different disciplines like physics, biology, you know, neurology and all, <coughs> Science covers the entire field of science. And... Um, so like this, all right, so like it was, it was published July 2nd, 2010, and the same day that it was published, Time Magazine ran a story on it. Uh, it, was, it was written by Eben Harrell, and um, the, the, the article he wrote for Time Magazine is called, Think You're Operating on Free Will? Mark, think Again. Okay, this is Time Magazine. Um, now, in the, in the magazine, Harold interviewed John Barge of Yale University. John Barge is um, one of the pioneers in this kind of research that that um, Custer's and Arts um, are reviewing in this paper. Now, Custer's and Arts, like the paper they wrote, they're, they're not really conducting any new research for this. It, it's called a review paper. So basically what they're doing is they're reviewing the literature, the research that has been done on these topics, you know, before them. And Barge was one of the pioneers in this research. I mean, like, you know, for example, um, well, he, he's quoted by Harrell, you know, in, in the Time pay, um, uh, journal or um, article saying that the paper by Custer's and Arts is a landmark. Nothing like it has been in science before. It's a large step toward overcoming skepti skepticism uh, surrounding this research. Um, it, is, it is like, you know, this basically, you know, there have been papers in, in peer-reviewed journals other than science before this, but the significance of, of a review article is when you have enough research on a certain, certain topic that you have substantial empirical evidence for certain claims, for certain conclusions, then that's when often they um, publish a review article that, that basically covers all the research and just um, basically emphasizes the significance of, of, of what's been done. And again, like according to Bars, this is a landmark article and it's, it's basically, you know, the, the, one of the premier science journals in the world um, basically saying no, uh, free will is an illusion. That our ba with, with, with the paper, the the research the paper covers is basically saying that the kinds of decisions that we generally think we're making with our conscious will are actually being made at the level of the unconscious. Okay, um, so um, so let's see what. Um, all right, and the other, another thing that Custer's and Arts do, do is that they, um, in addition to, to um, citing some of the, um, <coughs> the research that demonstrates, you know, unconscious decisions, decisions being made by the unconscious rather than by the conscious will, they also um, go through it like, they, they kind of like present um, potential mechanisms as to how this works. Now, in general, you know, the principle is that basically, I mean, it, it's easy to understand that we have parts of our mind that are unconscious to us. I mean, this is understood in hypnosis. Um, you know, there's much, in, in other words, when you think about it, anytime we make a decision, um, the decision is based on, has to be based on certain kinds of memories, thoughts, principles, ideas, 
you know, there has to be something upon which to decide. Now, obviously, if, if these um, criteria for any decision we make are not in our conscious mind because they can't be because basically our conscious mind can only focus on one or a few things at a time, that means that this data upon which we base any decision has to be at the level of the unconscious. Okay, so basically they present a mechanism for how this could work, but essentially the point is that, um, that in terms of refuting free will, if it's in any part of the unconscious, any kind of structure that's associated with the unconscious, whether it's the nervous system, the autom autonomic um, processes, any kind of unconscious process, that definitely you know, shows that it's not a freely willed decision. That the, um, that the acts that we do, you know, and this, you know, I've covered this on, on shows that I've done. Um, basically, you know, what I've presented is that, like, again, if you have, if you're making a decision, it's going to be based on certain um, criteria. Um, is it something that you predict is going to create greater pleasure, less pain in the future? Is it, does it abide by your moral principles? Does it make sense to do? Is it possible to do? Uh, is it in line with your um, survival instinct? I mean, we have a lot of hardwired drives, a lot of personality and different kinds of mechanisms that we must, you know, these, these are hardwired into us. These are like genetic drives that, that guide our behavior, and they're in the unconscious. Now, the, the key point here is that if that material is in the unconscious, and by definition, the unconscious is not a part of our mind that we have conscious access to, that means that to the processing of that decision of that you know whatever we decide has to also be at the level of the of the unconscious because think about it if our conscious mind isn't aware of that information by by definition we call it the unconscious obviously then the only part of our mind that has access to that information that's stored in the unconscious is the unconscious so then we come up with the idea that what what is consciousness Consciousness does not decide. Consciousness is simply awareness of what the unconscious has already decided. Okay, um, I just want to go through a brief quote um, in the Time um, magazine article by Custers. He kind of outlines what, what the, um, the paper is about. <coughs> he says, people often act in order to realize desired outcomes and they assume that consciousness drives that behavior. But the field, he's talking about psychology, now challenges the idea that there is only a conscious will. Our actions are very often initiated even though we are unaware of what we are seeking or why. Okay, this is Custer's uh, quote. Now, he says that like, I want to focus on, but the field now challenges the idea that there is only a conscious will. Actually, you know, that's a bit of a mistake. I mean, this is a brilliant paper, but it's actually inaccurate to say that there is only conscious will. Cause, because, again, as I just explained, if all the data that we're basing any decision on is in the level of the unconscious, that means that all the decision making has to be at the level of the unconscious. Um, so, so really, now what happens, okay, when, when we make, and, and you've got to understand, a lot of times our decisions are not about what's in our unconscious, you know, in our memory banks. So our decisions are often also about what we're perceiving, what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're feeling, what we're sensing in the environment in real time. Okay, so some, some might be tempted to conclude, well, all right, if, if what we're hearing and seeing and these real-time phenomenon are taking part in what's making us decide, then some people might conclude, well, that's the conscious mind that is then taking part in the decision. But no, you have to understand that um, whenever, whenever we are hearing anything, seeing anything, feeling, sensing anything, it's actually our unconscious that's primarily doing that experience, per that perception. And then what happens is the unconscious decides what part of our experience it's going to focus on, and that's what we term consciousness. That's what our conscious awareness is about. So, so again, it's, it's really inaccurate to say that, um, that there is any manner of, of conscious will at, at all. 
Okay. Um, so let's see. Okay. Now the, the paper focuses on goal attainment. Okay. Now what, the, the idea behind this is like back in 1980, um, Benjamin Labette published a paper that revolutionized everything. I mean, it just blew everybody's mind. Basically, what he did, he had subjects. And he hooked, he hooked up their, let's say, their finger to an electromyogram that measures muscle activity. Okay, then he measured up their brain to, um, I think he was using an electroencephalogram, an EEG, um, back then to measure brain activity. And these subjects had to basically look at a clock that spun really quickly and then decide when to flex their finger. Okay, now the, the electromyogram, the EMG, would, um, would monitor the muscle activity and the EEG would, would monitor their brain activity. Now, what Labette found was that before the subjects in these studies were actually consciously aware of having made the decision to flex their finger, their brain, their muscles had already activated the response. You know, so basically he was demonstrating that, you know, our decisions, our conscious decisions are preceded by unconscious activity. Now, with Labette's research, um, basically he was working with hundreds of milliseconds, you know, a fraction of a second that they could detect this unconscious muscular activity that had been initiated before the subject was aware of having made his decision to flex. In more recent replications of this research, um, researchers have established that they can find out seven to ten seconds before a subject decides on, you know, pressing a button or whatever they have the subjects do, you know, what the subject's going to um, do. Now, here's the thing: there was a there was objection to this um, initial research in the sense that. People were saying, well, all right, it's just a muscle activity. It's just a simple motor response. Okay, and that's the importance of this review because this review goes beyond the simple motor responses to include goal pursuits. I mean, uh, the, the pursuit of a goal is a much more complex process than simply deciding to move one's finger and, and, and moving it. So, um, okay, so in, in the paper, uh, Custer's and Arts write, as humans, we generally have the feeling that we decide what we want and what we do. Okay, um, all right, here's another criticism. Um, they say that we have the feeling, we decide, we, we feel that we decide what we do. In other words, what they're saying is that we feel we have a free will. We feel that we consciously decide what we're doing. But the reality is that that, um, it's not really a feeling, okay, because like, Basically, a feeling is like when you're sensing, let's see, say temperature or an emotion, fear, anger, disgust, you know, and any kind of like happiness, whatever, you know, a feeling is an emotion, um, an affective response. What, what actually takes place when, when we think that we're deciding what we do, and this is what, you know, why the Time article referred to, you know, you think you have free will, think again, is that the the illusion of free will is actually a conclusion. In other words, what happens is we make a decision, we attribute it to our conscious will, not realizing that consciousness is only awareness, you know, and then we conclude from that not being able to, to detect, to be aware of the underlying unconscious processes that cause that decision. We, we wrongly conclude that we have freely made that decision you know, overcoming the kinds of influences like genetics and, and, and the, you know, our upbringing that generally, you know, account for why we do what we do. Okay, so in other words, like, we do not feel that the illusion of free will, the illusion of conscious um, will is not a feeling, it's a conclusion. Um, this is important. Um, Daniel Wegner, um, back in 2002, he published a book called The Illusion of Conscious Will that was as revolutionary, in my opinion, as this paper by Custers and Arts in, in the journal Science, in that he went through an entire, you know, a review of, of a lot of literature 
um, that, that spans not just what Custer's and Arts covered, but just like way beyond it, demonstrating that so much of what we think we're consciously deciding is really actually um, being made at the level of the unconscious. Um, now, wh the reason I mention Wegner is because Wegner also uh, refers to the illusion of free will as a feeling. He says we feel that we have a free will. Again, we don't feel it. It's a, it's a conclusion. And then Sam Harris, who just published his revolutionary book um, in March of 2012. It's revolutionary because Sam Harris is the three times best-selling New York Times author. Uh, and his book, Free Will, is the first... It's really the first popular work to, to get as much press and publicity as, as any work has ever gotten to actively refute free will. And again, Harris kind of echoes that same mistake, citing that the um, that we feel that we have a free will. We don't. It's not a feeling. It's a conclusion. It's a mistaken conclusion based on not our, our just on not realizing not realizing what we know about the unconscious for example you know not realizing that if all of the data that we're basing our decision on is stored in the unconscious then the, the decision has to be made at the level of the unconscious for many people i would say for many people it's not really either a feeling or a conclusion as much as a belief and the reason i say that is because like the the term free will is actually coined in 580 AD by St. Augustine. And basically he was grappling with the question of evil. You know, in Christianity, the, the general belief is that God is all good. So if anything not good happens, it can't be God's fault. <clears throat> and so Augustine concluded that, well, if God wasn't doing stuff that, that was wrong, it had to be our, you know, our free will that was doing it. Now, um, again, it was kind of like a, a conclusion based on a premise that's actually refuted in Isaiah, because in Isaiah there's a line that, that God says, well, I create good, I create evil. So, I, you know, Augustine was actually ignoring that, that, um, that uh, phrase. But, again, the idea is that for some people, the belief, free will, the notion that they have a free will is more of a belief than either a feeling, which of course it can't be, or the conclusion. You know, people aren't really concluding that they have a free will. Um, they're, they're, this is what people are taught. You know, we're taught this from an early age. And again, with religion, if you're taught a certain belief, and you're, let's say, four or five years old, and you're taught, well, if you, you know, if you don't believe what the church or synagogues or you know a, a mosque will, will teach, then you might risk suffering eternally. You know. Um, and so naturally, it's kind of like difficult for, for very young kids who haven't developed their, their cognitive judgment abilities to be able to, you know, to think through things like that. They simply believe what they're taught. Okay, so, um, so again, the, the paper begins um, what uh, Hank, Hank and um, Custer's, Custer and Hart's paper be begins by... Um, by explaining Lebet's work, and I just want to read something from that. He basically they write in a remarkable experiment conducted more than 25 years ago. Um, research participate, participants were instructed to freely choose when to move their index finger while the timing of the action itself, of its preparation in the brain, and of when the person became aware of the decision to act were measured. Although the decision did indeed precede the action, the preparation of the finger movement in the brain was well on its way by the time people consciously decided to act. Okay, so basically they're citing what I just explained about Lebet's research that was that, you know, um, people kind of like criticized initially in that it was just basically dealing with simple motor responses. So they begin with that because they, again that was a landmark finding that that basically in, in, the, in the field of neuroscience just changed everything. That's, that's probably one of the main reasons why the, the question of human will, whether we have a free will or not, has really gone from philosophy, where it kind of a, like languished for centuries because the philosophers really just weren't thinking very clearly, in my opinion. Just, they just, um, 
you know, just the, the idea that they, they didn't understand basic causality. Anyway, it's gone from, from philosophy to science, where in, in science you can't just say anything just because, you know, it seems to make sense. You have to, like, provide evidence for it, scientific evidence. And, and it's much more rigorous than philosophy. With philosophy, you can pretty much say anything and present a theory, and it doesn't have to be falsifiable. It can just, you know, it doesn't even have to make sense. So anyway, so that was the, um, the significance of Labette's research in this. Okay, um, so again, in, in this quote that I just, um, all, right, well, all right, so they, they, they quote um, Labette's work and they go on. They go on and they say, when people are persuaded to consciously set a goal to engage in behavior, their conscious will to act starts out unconsciously. Okay, again, I want to correct them. Um, there is no such thing as a conscious will. Again, consciousness is only awareness, okay? Consciousness is basically the unconscious making us aware of what it's choosing to focus on. Because again, like, the, think about our, un our unconscious right now. Like, as you're listening to this, as I'm talking, right, right now my heart's beating, my lungs are moving, all the blood is coursing through my, by my veins and all. This happens with, with all of us all the time. This is all done by the unconscious simultaneously. You know, we're not even aware of it. So the idea is, like, the unconscious is able to, kind of like a computer, multi multitask. It's able to do many things simultaneously where the conscious mind can at, at most, you know, focus on one or two th or three things. And again, the basic point, this, I have to, like, you know, go through this again. If the conscious mind is not aware of the unconscious by definition, then obviously it can't sift through all the data in the unconscious to be able to make a decision, any, any kind of decision, whether it's a motor, simple motor response or a more complicated um, goal pursuit response. Okay, so, um, so basically, all right, so now again, it's a very important point. Consciousness is only awareness, it's not decision making. And that is another very, very strong reason why um, free will must be impossible and why, you know, this work by Custer's and Arthur is so revolutionary. Okay. Um, okay, so actually they, you know, so they, they um, in the last passage that I read, they, they mistakenly refer to a conscious will. Then they kind of like correct themselves right immediately afterwards. They say the finding that the pursuit of goals that we consciously set and adopt is prepared unconsciously, at least in the earliest moments before we act on them, is intriguing. So they're acknowledging that what we think we're consciously setting as a goal to adopt is actually be done, being done before that at the level of the unconscious. Okay, um, so now again, the kind of research that they're reviewing is what in the field is called as priming research. I'm going to go into this a bit um, later. You know, with the with the work of Barge and and, and many others, but um, but what they do before they get into that, they mention the work of Freud and others, who basically showed how the unconscious um, is responsible for for making for doing things that we would ordinarily ordinarily attribute to the uh, our conscious mind. For example, a classic classic experiment. They um, they hypnotize somebody. Okay, and they, they give them a post-hypnotic suggestion that when they awake from the hypnosis, you know, like a phone will ring or some, by some cue, what they're going to do is they're going to go over to the window where they see a flower pot, okay? They're going to take the flower pot, cover it with a cloth, bring it from the window, put it on a table, and bow to it three times, okay? This has been done. This is not fiction, okay? So they conduct this experiment, and... You know, the subjects do this. They'll go to the, you know, after they're, they're not hypnotized. This is after the hypnosis. It's a post-hypnotic suggestion. And so they do that. They'll, they'll go to the window, take the flower pot, cover it with a cloth that's there, put it to a table, and bow to it three times. Then when they're asked, well, why did you do that? 
they'll they'll invent a story. They'll say, well, you know, I kind of the the, the 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 plant seemed cold by the window, so I figured I'd covered it <laughs> with the with the cloth, and then I felt it, you know, it, it looked better or something on the table, so I put it there, and then I was proud. I I was pleased with what I did, so I bowed three times. This happens, you know. So basically, this is what 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 this kind of research demonstrated is that, you know, much of what we think we're doing consciously, we're actually doing, you know, for no conscious reason at all, for reasons that we're completely unaware of, in this case, because we were given the post-hypnotic suggestion to do that. Okay, now, um, so they met, in this work, they mention this, because it's important. It's important to understand that this conscious activity, conscious deciding of what we do has been known for, for you know, over 100 years now. They, they rightly assert that um, Freud's com complex theory on the, on the unconscious was largely unfalsifiable. In other words, like sometimes with scientific um, uh, research theories, hypothesizing, a, a, a theory has to be falsifiable in, in order to be quote-unquote scientific. Now, uh, Freud's theories of the id, ego, and su superego don't necessarily fit into that category, but you know, notwithstanding, the research on hypnosis done by Freud and the hypnotists clearly show that the unconscious, you know, makes decisions, makes us do things, and then we consciously invent, we actually fabricate reasons why we did what, um, what the unconscious, you know, obviously did without our, our conscious control. Okay, so that's important research. Okay, now at the, at the bottom of page 47, uh, Custers and Arts basically go through the basic thesis of their, of their paper. And I'm going to read this, and we're, gonna, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go into, I guess, part two right after this. But basically what they say is that here we review the research demonstrating that goals and the motivation to pursue them can arise unconsciously, and we propose a mechanism for how this may happen. Okay, so all right, well, that's it for... For this section, again, because I've, I've only covered part of it, I'm going to like go through the, um, the second part in part two of this you know, truly landmark paper. I, I, I would imagine that because it's been published in science, and you know, once I get it on, onto the internet and pr provide the link, I'm sure that many people are going to be much more aware of it, then this is going to lead to much more of this kind of empirical, not philosophical evidence that our decisions, what we decide, is actually based on processes that are completely unconscious to us, on processes that we're not even aware of, and that demonstrates how free will must be impossible. Or I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks.